I fell in love with early dance very early in my life. And I started a dance group decades ago. But for many years that had to be, uh, well, my, my, my main day job uh, left me little time really to do that. A few years ago, I had the chance to um, to get an early retirement. And uh, so now I really can concentrate on dance and dance research. And um, my friend Eva uh, is a musicologist and also a member of my dance group. And a while ago, she, while doing a research project in local history, that is Hamburg, Germany, <laughs> local, <laughs> She uh, stumbled upon the name Knoll. It's actually Knoll, not Knoll. It's a German word with a different pronunciation. And uh, a dancing master. And uh, she asked me whether I had heard of him. And uh, coincidentally, I had just recently acquired a dance description by somebody called Knoll in my collection of dance books. So we talked about it and we found out, we tried to find out who this person was and um, we found very little about him, but then we started researching and found out it was not just one person, it was a family, like so often with, like it is so often with dancers, it was a whole dance master family. Mm -hmm. And well, from then on, we were hooked and... Uh, and Birte, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but I just wanted to say, um, it, I can well remember the weeks, the first weeks that we spent, it was um, quite a feverish run with um, uh, the telephones were just hot the lines and um, we were just ex um, exchanging news and, and um, thought, well, Knoll is just one person, just like Berta just said. But then uh, we found one, two, three, in fact, four different people in, in one family who were active dancers, active professional dancers and teachers. And then um, it just exploded. So over to you, yeah. Berta. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we, we, th we um, think that this forgotten family does have some uh, significance, both in local history for our hometown, Hamburg, but also in dance history in general. And okay, so let's start now with our lecture. Yeah, just imagine a modern day ballet master of uh, the modern Hamburg State Opera. Um, sorry? Can you see the screen? Oh, can you all see the screen? Yeah, yeah. that's fine. Yeah, we can see Okay. It. Yeah, just imagine uh, a ballet master of the modern Hamburg State Opera today would create a choreography for the members of a bicycle club. And the corps de ballet would show tricks on their bikes in an entertainment venue to a large audience. It's uh, this combination of ballet and cycling nowadays, of course, would be very unlikely. But in 1869, exactly that happened in Hamburg. So here are some pictures of Hamburg. They are slightly later than the time we're talking about, but you can see two main uh, views. Uh, on the bottom right, there is the harbor. And on the top left, there is, you can see, just see the, the Alster, this uh, lake in the town. You can also just make out the um, the harbor over here, the, uh, the masts of the ships, and the, um, what is now the state opera uh, and was the uh, Stadttheater in those days would be behind these uh, houses here. These houses all look fairly new because in 1842, 
uh, Hamburg, in, there was a big fire that destroyed the whole inner city of Hamburg. So the inner city is nothing medieval or anything like that. It was built, rebuilt in that period. Right. Um, the year 1867 was a milestone in the development of the bicycle, then called Velocipede. At the World Exhibition in Paris, the French locksmiths Ernest and Pierre Michaud presented the bone shakers, as they were called, and landed a worldwide marketing hit. All at once, Velocipedes were the must-have of the season, and commercial production started in earnest. From 1868, the first Velocipedes were spotted in the streets of Paris, Vienna, Munich, and other European cities. By 1869, Velocipede clubs were founded quite literally all around the globe, and the Velocipede craze dominated the newspaper headlines. Not a week passed by without the latest gossip about this new means of transportation, about technical improvements, as well as particularly dramatic incidents with these fascinating new machines. Everybody was talking about the Velocipedes. But there was still some uncertainty about what this new way of locomotion was. Uh, was it akin to horseback riding, perhaps? Here you can see, uh, I think it's from a Viennese newspaper, the, uh, an advertisement for somebody who would do tricks, uh, would do tricks like riders do on horseback, uh, on bareback horses, um, on his bike, so. Or was it a kind of sport? Here we see the winners of uh, one of the first major bicycle races in France. Or was it something related to dance? These pictures come from a manual about uh, bicycle riding from exactly that year, 1869, and with some exercises like riding your bike with just one foot. And here are the floor patterns you, you are supposed to make with, with riding your bike. So that, I think that does look a little bit like dancing, doesn't it? Yes, in an article, um, covering the current ball season, the Viennese newspaper Fremdenblatt predicted that very soon paid balls might be announced and that the pinnacle of the art of dancing would be a velocipede gallop. Indeed, velocipede gallops, inspired by the speed of the bicycle and its similarity to horseback riding, were soon written by numerous composers. These are just a few samples of um, of um, um, the music that was composed in, in the style of Velocipede, but that's just connected to the speed, not just not to the dance or any dance. Um, among the composers was Hans Christian Lumbi and Josef Strauss, a brother of the Waltz King, Johann Strauss the Younger. And there was music a la Velocipede for many other other than popular dance types, waltzes, polkas, Chartiges and quadrilles. Yeah, you can see that um, female bicycle riders were really um, interesting for the audience, probably because you could see so much of their legs. And this is my favorite uh, music cover because these um, figures, they re uh, these little bicycle riders, they really seem to perform the figures of a quadrille. So that's... The old, that picture also strikes me as being a very loud one. Imagine those, those wheels and um, they were pretty heavy, these fellows who paid. And then um, having them on a stage perhaps with a wooden floor underneath, it must have been a very loud thing to do. Yeah. So while, while that was just ordinary dance music, merely inspired by the Velocipede, in Hamburg in April 1869, one could actually see dances involving bikes, genuine bikes. 
One of the largest entertainment venues of the city at this time was Zagebiel's Etablissement, which boasted several very large halls. After an alteration in the 1880s, the Etablissement could, could hold up to no fewer than 10,000 visitors in, in several of these large halls. You, this is one, you can see one, and there is one behind, and on the other side there are more, and upstairs there are more. This venue has actually been completely forgotten in local history. Most people don't know about it because it was destroyed in the war, and there is a, now a big parking, uh, car park, a big car, car park building on that spot. So in this space here, the audience eager for new sensations could watch the latest choreographies for velocipedes. The local newspaper Hamburger Nachrichten wrote, the Vel velocipede riding that was held on Thursday and Friday in the Great Hall of Sagebiel's Etablissement, particularly suitable for this purpose, attracted a large crowd. Many of the riding gentlemen proved to be very capable in handling this new means of transportation. For example, they performed a quadrille directed by ballet master A. Knoll with great aplomb, which met with high approval by the audience. One can only guess if this quadrille was modeled after equestrian quadrilles or the quadrilles of the ballroom, as you probably all know, uh, square dances for four couples usually, or after costumed uh, group show dances that were also called quadrilles in that, in that period. But you have to keep in mind that it had been choreographed by an experienced ballet master and dance teacher, Albert Knoll. Just a few days later, eight ballerinas from the Corps de Ballet of the Stadttheater excelled in performing on velocipedes in the same hall. The night before last, in the great hall of Zagebiel's Etablissement, there was another velocipede run by eight ballet ladies of the Municipal Theatre. For the most part, they showed an extraordinary dexterity in handling this speed engine and had an admirable stamina in driving. Their daring and quick turns in different figures repeatedly provoked lively applause. In general, this new spectacle, arranged most agreeably, was greatly enjoyed by the audience. Ballet master Albert Knoll, who was presumably um, responsible for the choreography of that performance as well, would not have considered the art of ballet as we today might, as an elitist high culture. A categoriz categorization of the kind would have been strange in his time. So who was Albert Knoll? He was born in uh, 1832 in Breslau, which is now Poland and uh, received his ballet training at the Municipal Theater, the Stadttheater in Breslau. Uh, that was still the era when uh, the famous ballerinas of their time uh, would travel without a company of their own, just on their own, travel uh, around Europe and perform on, on, many, of, in, in, on many stages and relied on the local corps de ballet to support them in that performance. Um, so Albert, uh, a very gifted young dancer, at that time would have the chance to actually share the stage with, with people like Fanny Cerrito. But just when his dancing career took up momentum, it was interrupted by his parents. They were not keen on him uh, being a professional dancer and forced him into an apprenticeship to become a confectioner, which he hated. <laughs> but um, soon afterwards, his parents uh, must have died and that enabled him to put on his dancing shoes again. What he then did was he joined uh, a troupe of traveling dancers and acrobats the Shear brother, brothers, um, brothers 
uh, three brothers originally from Vienna. The eldest was actually a ballet um, yeah, a dancer and ballet master and the younger ones were more or less just acrobats and they had a very mixed program of ballets and acrobatics. Um, Albert must have learned a tremendous lot touring with them. Mm. So when he, when eventually he came home to his, uh, to Breslau in, in 1851, he joined uh, that theater again as this time as a principal dancer. He stayed there until uh, 1858 when he left for Hamburg. There he was engaged as a ballet master and principal dancer. Uh, at the uh, at the Stadttheater, the predecessor of the modern Hamburg State Opera. When he first came there, ballet was in very very high regard at that stage. Uh, stage due to the then director Volheim, who was an ardent ballet enthusiast, um, who actually ne neglected the other um, branches of, of his stage, opera and drama for ballet. And in those days, the ballet, uh, the theater programs would not be just one opera a night or one ballet or one drama, but usually a combination of two or three of them. So one opera and uh, one drama and, and then a little bit ballet or larger ballet and so on. Uh, and actually you could see ballet more or less every night in the opera. That changed when uh, Volheim left in 1861 and less ballet was shown. But then Albert also had to stop his active career as a dancer. We don't know why, but I, we somehow guess it, he might have had an injury or so because it was, he was still young for a, for a dancer. Here you can see him actually in, uh, in Giselle. Uh, the ballerina is Marie Freitag, uh, a ballerina from Warsaw, who visited Hamburg and performed Giselle there several times. So this is, this is Albert in his heydays as a dancer. And in Hamburg, it wasn't Giselle, but Gisela. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gisela und die Willis. Yes. Um, so uh, from then on, Albert needed other sources also for a stable income to support his large family. He had, he and his wife, Therese, an actress, um, had no less than 14 children over the next years, um, most of them actually reaching adulthood. She, he was also not continuously um, then employed as a ballet master, but sort of on and off. Um, so what he did is he, also, he founded his own dancing school, Tanz- und Anstandsinstitut, where Hamburg's Jeunesse Dory acquired their manners and their dance steps. And uh, one other thing he did was he was choreographing for the major circus companies of those days, Bush, Renz, and others, which is again something which we find a bit strange nowadays. But in those days, it was not uncommon for uh, the big circuses to employ ballet masters to do choreographers for their for their huge shows. That was not just a, a lion jumping through a ring or something like that, but they had a whole. Uh, I mean, I think you could compare it with musicals. It was a story. It was a huge scenery. They had I don't know. They had a, a pool on stage when they water was uh, somehow called for in the story. So that was really big entertainment for, for the masses. Um, and uh, Albert excelled in that. He was also a very value, highly va valued uh, member of the uh, new German societies of dance teachers. Um, 
He was board member of the Akademie der Tanzlehrkunst and uh, later an honorary member of the Genossenschaft Deutscher Tanzlehrer. And he continued teaching right up to his death in 1910. So with his um, acrobatic and circus background, a novelty like a velocipede quadrille fitted well within his, his range of professional activities. But why did the corps de ballet participate in such an exotic venture? Well, in the mid 19th century, the period we talk about, um, Hamburg uh, could already look back on a long, long opera and theater tradition speckled with famous names. In 1678, the first operatic venture open to the general public had been founded in Hamburg. In the early 1700s, George Frederick Handel had been engaged as violinist in the Hamburg Opera Orchestra before he went on to London to start an enormously successful career as composer of operas and oratorios. From 1722 to 1738, Georg Philipp Telemann held the position of opera director. And in the 1760s, the famous poet and dramatist Gotthold Ephraim Lessing had been engaged as dramaturge in Hamburg. However, by the 1860s, theater life in Hamburg looked far from promising. The Hamburg Stadttheater was still not subsidized by the city and therefore almost constantly hard pressed for money. Only the annual opulent and extremely popular Christmas fairy tale spectacles were guaranteed box office hits. Um, these shows were not only aimed at children, adults too flocked to see the elaborate costumes, stage design, the popular actors, and the dancing and acrobatics that all together formed an utterly colorful spectacle. Albert Knoll was an expert in that kind of production. The story of Snow White and the Dwarfs, or Schneewittchen and Die Sieben Zwerge, first performed in December 1868, was one of his biggest hits. In April 1869, by the time of the Velocipede shows, it was still a staple part of the program, and the last performances of this Yuletide comedy took place as late as May. So here's the um, cover of Snivitian, um, the textbook that was given out during the performance. And it was given, um, um, well, you could take it home as a souvenir, of course. Well, this is actually a later edition, but uh, it is the same play. Yeah. But even a big office, a big box office hit as Snow White was not enough to prevent financial disaster. In May, the situation came to a head. After not having been paid the full salary for months, the theater personnel went on strike. Theater director Reichardt had to, had to quit. Until the end of the season, the staff ran the theater themselves. So we guess that's probably the desperate financial situation that forced the dancers to look for other means of income beyond the stage and to mount the velocipede. We, this one is not one of our dancers, but it, they must have looked something like this. Mm -hmm. Again, showing their dancers' legs. Um, looking at the adv advertisements uh, that the concert and dance halls in Hamburg published during the following months in order to attract the audiences, one can see that Knoll and his ballet dancers had hit the trend right on the head with their novel creation of Velocipede quadrilles. The Apollo Saal, uh, situated actually right opposite the theater, offered Velocipede balls, where you can see they claim that tous les dames du ballet would display their acrobatic skills as well as their white stocking legs. I think those were not the uh, Dame de, du Ballet from the uh, uh, Stadttheater, but uh, I guess the Apollo Saal um, employed dancers um, themselves. So um, they would also 
perform the Cancan, so would have another occasion, another opportunity to see legs. Um, but it was also actually a ball. You can see they, uh, the the guests could would dance a polonaise, a waltz, polka, gallop. So, and another place was a Luda salon. A place usually dedicated to more conventional forms of entertainment like fireworks, military concerts, skittles and billiards. But they boasted the unsurpassable bicycle performance of a true red Indian chief. The savage Mr. Jonathan may ha just have been an advertising invention. But it is clear that the Viennese Fremdenblatt had been right. And the enthusiasm for velocipedes was as great in Hamburg as in New York, Paris, Vienna, or London. In 1869, the popular velocipede balls were all the rage. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I think you wanted to say the last thing. <laughs> well, um, 1869 was a very exceptional year, but um, in the way of the, uh, the history of the bicycle, but um, it was a um, true surprise for us to see that uh, the Knolls were also right into it and um, uh, somehow it just, well, it tells us also a lot about the Knoll family because they were always, um, always uh, hitting, were there at the right time, at the right spot, and to pick up the latest trends. And um, in the later career of that family, we also um, can see that happening. But 1869 was a very exceptional year, also for the Knolls and also for Hamburg. So thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you.